Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about the death penalty, or capital punishment, and we all know what that is, right? When someone is killed by the state as punishment for a criminal act. And I want to talk about this for a few reasons. Firstly, while most countries around the world have either abolished capital punishment outright or only use it in very specific and rare circumstances, much of the world's population still lives in countries that retain the death penalty. Also, in countries that have abolished the death penalty, it can remain popular, and its reintroduction is often argued for. A 2017 YouGov survey found that more than half of Brexit Leave voters in the UK, for instance, think that the death penalty should be brought back. Another reason I want to talk about the death penalty today is because I've noticed that frequently, when discussing the pros and cons of the death penalty, people tend to have the wrong argument. And for an example of this, we're going to take a look at a typical pro-death penalty argument, such as the one offered by Dennis Prager of PragerU in his video, Is the Death Penalty Ever Moral?, which I will link below in the video description. In this video, Dennis Prager argues that criminals who do sufficiently horrible things should be put to death, and he uses as an example the 2007 Cheshire, Connecticut home invasion murders, during which two criminals broke into a family's house and murdered three people in a particularly brutal manner. Dennis Prager's argument in favour of executing these men is an emotional argument, and he appeals directly to the feelings of his audience, talking about things like a sense of justice, the pain inflicted on the loved ones of those murdered, and asks whether torturers, rapists, murderers, and evil men like them deserve to keep their lives. And this sort of appeal to emotion is the main thrust of many pro-death penalty arguments. Now, whether someone can forfeit the right to life with a sufficiently horrible action or series of actions is a moral question, it's a philosophical question, and it's not a question that I'm going to be answering today. If you believe that people who commit terrible crimes, such as Dennis Prager describes, deserve in turn to lose their lives, I am not going to argue with you here. In fact, we can proceed as if that is definitely true, if you like, because regardless of how you feel about that question, it doesn't actually have anything to do with what we'll be talking about today, which is whether the death penalty, as a practical process, should actually be carried out. Is it possible for someone to lose the right to life is a different question to should society have the death penalty, and I'm going to be arguing that no matter how you feel about the former question, the answer to the latter question is no. And if you disagree with that right now, all I ask is that you stick around for the rest of the video and hear me out. Now before we start, it is worth pointing out that many anti-death penalty arguments also appeal to emotion, and I'm going to be trying to avoid those arguments going forward. Reading or watching anti-death penalty arguments you will often hear about, for example, how the difficulty of securing the chemicals for lethal injections means that inferior chemicals can be used, which can lead to drawn-out and painful or botched executions and so on. Now, regardless of how any individual feels about that, I don't see it being all that much of a convincing argument to someone who is currently in favour of the death penalty, since if you think a criminal did something so bad that they should be killed, you probably don't care too much if they get hurt on the way out, right? So as much as possible today, I'm going to be trying to avoid the emotional arguments and stick to the facts. And to begin with here, let's stay with Dennis Prager's video for a while. He opens his video by asserting that he just doesn't understand people who oppose the death penalty. The gulf is unbridgeable, he says, between those of us who believe that some murderers should be put to death, and those who believe that no murderer should ever be put to death. Later, at the end of the video, he calls back to this opening paragraph, stating, But if you really do believe these people deserve to keep their lives, well, as I said at the outset, I don't understand you. Now, these two quotes illustrate perfectly the disconnect I talked about a minute ago. In the opening, Dennis Prager is talking about the process of people being put to death, but at the end he's talking about the philosophical question of whether those people deserve to keep their lives. Two different questions which he's treating as if they're the same. In doing this, what Dennis Prager is missing is the possibility that someone could believe that criminals who do the sorts of evil things he describes do deserve to lose their lives, but that the death penalty is, separately to that, still a bad idea. Oh! Well, the first thing is there's crimes that the proper penalty is obviously death. Obviously. Like, and I've read a lot 
about serial killers, for example. I read a lot of brutal material, you know. I was very interested in criminology and antisocial behavior, as well as political pathology. It's so like, there are guys like, I think it was John Wayne Gacy, who, yeah, you don't want to know about him. I think he begged the judge for the death penalty. Like, he knew himself, as like, there was no coming back from where he went. Hmm. So, but that's not the issue for me. The issue is, do you give the state that much power? And I would say, practically, no. I think, and this is a very callous way of looking, I think in the United States it costs $20 million to put someone to death. It's like, why? Well, because the state shouldn't just be able to do that mm -hmm. easily. And they make mistakes, like a lot of yeah. mistakes. And so maybe you just never want the state to have that much power. And I think that's a reasonable argument. It's not, yeah, that, I'm that's not comfortable where, with that. That's the, where I'm at with it. I just don't want to give the state that power. So. That was Jordan Peterson there, expressing to Dave Rubin his opinion that people can deserve to be killed, but that he just doesn't trust the state to wield that much power. And this is a common anti-death penalty argument made by anti-big government folks. I picked a clip of Jordan Peterson there because he has been the narrator of multiple PragerU videos. So if Dennis Prager would like to understand an anti-death penalty argument, I suppose he could just ask Jordan Peterson. Peterson's argument also reveals a contradiction in Prager's position, and it's to do with the size and role of the government. We all know how PragerU feels about the government, right? And by the way, when does the government do a good job at fixing anything? The bigger the government, the smaller the citizen. Why is the government so bad at health care? The government is killing small businesses, killing them with excessive taxes, overregulation, and complicated compliance. The worst environmental offenders have been big, repressive socialist governments. People in government will sell government influence for personal and political gain. It's mired in bureaucracy and it's fraught with waste. The more a government tightens its grip, the less an economy grows. So what's the solution? Less government, not more. Yes, the government is big, bloated, slow, corrupt, mired in red tape and regulations. It's not fit to run the DMV, let alone a healthcare system. And this is the government that Dennis Prager trusts to competently decide who deserves to live and die? Why? The same state bureaucracy that his other videos describe as inefficient and corrupt is suddenly perfectly competent when it comes to sentencing the death penalty. Is having the power to end the lives of its citizens not the ultimate example of big government? Not to wander off topic too much here, but this is an example of how most of the time when people complain about the size of the government, their arguments usually have very little to do with the actual size of the government. In a less silly world, if someone claimed to be against big government, we might assume that they support things like decreasing military spending, ending wars, demilitarizing the police, reducing the number of people in prison, and relevant for us here, being against the death penalty. If you don't trust the government and want it to be smaller, you probably shouldn't also want it to have an enormous army, an armed police force, and power of life and death over its citizens. Too often, though, people who complain about big government love all that stuff, and what they actually mean when they say big government is solely government healthcare and welfare programs. Anyway, to get back on track, Dennis Prager has decided to break with PragerU tradition and now totally trusts the government to judge and implement the death penalty fairly and accurately. He says the number of innocent people who might be wrongly executed is infinitesimally small thanks to DNA testing and other advanced forensic tools which make executing an innocent person virtually impossible. The chance of executing an innocent person is of course one of the most common and strongest arguments against the death penalty. Because, obviously, if it comes to light that someone was wrongfully imprisoned, they can be let out of prison. But if it comes to light that someone was wrongfully executed, that's it. They're dead. Dennis Prager steps around this argument by saying our modern forensic tools make it virtually impossible to execute an innocent person. But he's missing something there. He's making a rather big assumption. Now, before we get into exactly what he is missing here, let's first imagine an airtight murder case. Let's say a husband and wife are walking down the street when they're approached by a mugger armed with a gun. And in the process of robbing the couple, he shoots and kills the wife. 
The police are called, and based upon the description of the criminal given to the police by the husband, they pick up a suspect near the scene of the crime. When they bring the suspect to the husband, he says, yes, that's him. He's the person who shot my wife. The police then arrest the suspect, and when they later question him, he admits to the crime and signs a written confession saying, yes, I did it. I'm the person who shot that woman. So, case closed, right? We have a positive identification of the murderer from a witness who was a foot away when the crime was committed, and a signed written confession from the murderer saying that they did it. Few cases get more clear-cut than that. So, this case was an actual case. The crime happened in May of the year 2000. Two tourists from Georgia, that's the state, not the country, were staying at a Ramada Inn in Jacksonville, Florida. Outside of their hotel, they were approached by a criminal who, in the process of mugging them, shot and killed Mary Ann Stevens. Her husband, James Stevens, identified Brenton Butler, who was picked up nearby by the police as the killer, and Butler confessed to the murder during questioning. However, as I imagine many of you already suspect, there is more to this case than meets the eye. Firstly, the husband of the victim was mistaken in his identification of the criminal. He just got the wrong guy. And this is a thing that happens. Witnesses make mistakes, particularly witnesses who were just involved in a very traumatic experience. Uh, but why, you might wonder, did the wrong guy confess to the crime? Well, during the trial, Brenton Butler alleged that the police physically abused him into confessing. They allegedly, again, my lawyer's reminding me to say, physically intimidated him and hit him several times until he confessed to the crime. This is all the subject of a very interesting documentary called Murder on a Sunday Morning, which I would highly recommend if you want to know more about this case. The film follows Butler's defence team, two public defenders called Patrick McGuinness and Anne Finnell, as they put together the case for Butler's innocence. And they rarely tear the police apart in the courtroom and expose their awful and incompetent investigation, which is very satisfying to watch. The police, for example, didn't even search Brenton Butler's house looking for the items he supposedly stole, or interview his family members with regards to his whereabouts at the time of the crime. You know you didn't have a gun. You knew you didn't have a purse. You knew you didn't have any money. You knew you didn't have a fisherman's hat, right? That's all correct. Okay. Did you ask Brent, can I go search your house, your room? No, sir, I did not. Did you get a search warrant for his house? No, sir, I did not. You wanted to find a gun and a purse and bloody clothes and everything else, right? Yes, sir. Would have been nice. So why not get a search warrant? Well, we just sit and get a search warrant. And it's not that hard to imagine what allegedly happened here. A tourist was shot and killed outside a hotel. That is not a great headline for attracting more tourists to your town. So there's a lot of pressure on the police to solve that particular crime very quickly. And here you have an eyewitness who has already identified someone in your custody who they say did the crime. And that someone is a teenager who you just need to get to sign a piece of paper to put this case away quickly. So, you make him sign the paper. Allegedly. And you don't go around investigating other things that you know will make the case against him weaker. So you don't search his house for the stolen items that you know aren't there. You don't interview potential alibis who could get him off the hook. You just pin everything on the witness ID and the confession, and hope that that's enough to get the case across the line. So, you might ask why I'm talking about this particular case in a video about the death penalty. Butler was too young to be given the death penalty anyway, even if he was found guilty, so that wouldn't apply here. And, even if he was found guilty, the real killer was later caught when someone tipped the police off to who it was, so Butler probably would have been let out anyway, even if he was wrongly convicted. But my point here is to show a case in which the criminal justice system, or part of it, in this case the police force, could have a motivation to deliberately allow an innocent person to be convicted of a crime they did not commit. This is what Dennis Prager misses when discussing investigative techniques and forensic tools. Because yes, in many cases we do have very powerful forensic tools, but you also have to be able to trust the people with those tools not to lie, and also to actually use the tools, I suppose. What Prager leaves out is the human element. The police will sometimes, for example, plant evidence. 
There was a case just recently in New York where an officer was caught on camera appearing to plant drugs in a car. And this is similar to a case from last year when a Florida police officer was arrested after an investigation showed he repeatedly planted meth on people during traffic stops. Police will sometimes take bribes from criminals. They will lie in court, cover up for the crimes of other officers, beat confessions out of innocent people, and so on. Even if all cops are bastards is a little too absolutist for you, you have to admit that sometimes some cops are bastards, and some judges are bastards, and some lawyers, a lot of lawyers, are bastards, or incompetent, or lazy, or corrupt, or just apathetic. The accuracy of a particular investigative technique or forensic method is only one part of the calculation we have to do when determining odds of someone being innocent. We also have to trust the justice system not to lie, or cheat, or just have made a mistake. You can say DNA analysis of a piece of evidence is almost perfectly accurate, but it cannot tell you whether or not that piece of evidence was planted at the scene of a crime. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily going to be a very common occurrence, don't get me wrong, but it is a possibility. We have an imperfect justice system run by imperfect people. No one type of evidence is ever going to be flawless, even video evidence. Dennis Prager in his video says, Opponents of capital punishment oppose the death penalty even when there is absolute proof of the murderer's guilt. If there were a video of a man burning a family alive, opponents of capital punishment would still oppose taking that man's life. Now, the implication there is that a video would be absolute proof of guilt. But is it really? This is a statement that's going to be less and less true over time, and that's simply because technological advances mean that video is getting easier and easier to fake. It is getting harder to spot videos that are authentic and videos that were created in a computer. Many of you will remember this video from a few years ago of a fake Barack Obama that was created in a computer using an AI video tool. Now, the more observant folks in the audience might still be able to tell this is fake. You can see something seems a little off about it, right? However, it is already eerily similar to the real thing, is it not? And before long, it's going to be very difficult indeed to tell the difference between authentic videos and fake videos like this one. And if you were led by my prompting there to believe that this is a fake video of Barack Obama, then we are already at that moment, because this is not a fake video of Barack Obama. This is a real video of Barack Obama. I just put a real video under the headline describing the fake one. Anyway, me being a smart ass aside, while faked videos aren't a huge problem for the legal system right now, as the technology gets both more advanced and easier to use, it very well could be a problem in the future. And even with a non-fake video, we can still imagine perfectly possible scenarios in which executing a man based on video evidence of him committing a crime would be a bad idea. What if the man had off-screen accomplices in his crime? If you kill him, you've got less of a chance of finding them, right? What if the person doing the crime was someone who was coerced or forced into it by some other person? What if someone threatened to murder his family unless he did the horrible thing on their behalf? Again, as with a bribed judge or planted evidence, I'm not saying that these things would be happening every day, just that it is a possibility. And no matter how unlikely, if you execute enough people, you will eventually kill an innocent person. So the pro-death penalty argument has to be that killing the occasional innocent person is an acceptable risk, because that risk is outweighed by the positives that come from having the death penalty. So, what are the positives to having the death penalty? One you will often see proposed is cost. Why should the taxpayer pay to feed and clothe some horrible murderer who might live for another however many decades, right? It would be better and cheaper to just kill them outright. Well, in practice, this isn't actually true. In the United States, for instance, it is vastly more expensive to execute people than to imprison them for life. Executing someone is a very complicated and slow legal process. Some inmates spend more than 20 years on death row before being executed. It's so slow because there are various stages of review and appeal before the death penalty can actually be carried out. Now, the obvious counter-argument to this is to say, well, what if we just sped that process up a little? 
if we just executed people right after they were found guilty, that massive expense would not exist, right? And execution would be the cheaper option. And the counter-argument to this counter-argument is that the slow appeal and review process exists for a very good reason. If you fought my proposed scenarios a minute ago as to how an innocent person could end up being executed sounded like ridiculous million-to-one shots, then what you need is a real-life example. So let's talk about the rather infamous case of Timothy Evans, something I imagine some of you will know about already. So Timothy Evans was a Welshman who lived in London in 1949 with his wife and child. And in November of 1949, he went to the police and informed them that his wife, Beryl Evans, had died. And the story he told police was that his wife was pregnant, but since the couple thought they could not support another child, they had taken up the proposal of their downstairs neighbour, John Christie, who had offered to perform an abortion. Christie apparently botched the abortion and accidentally killed Beryl Evans. Christie then persuaded Timothy Evans to go and stay with relatives in Wales while he disposed of Beryl Evans' body and made arrangements for a couple to look after their daughter. So, Timothy Evans went to Wales, only to a few weeks later decide to go to the police and tell them what had happened. Only, when he first told the story to the police, he left Christie out of it, saying that he himself had been the one to dispose of his wife's body, and the one who arranged for his daughter to be looked after. In response to this account, the police searched the place where Evans said he had disposed of the body, which was in a sewer drain, only to find there was no body there, and that lifting the drain cover would have been physically impossible for a single man. So Evans, when re-questioned, changed his story, and this time included Christie, stating that he had previously been trying to protect Christie by not mentioning him. So Evans told the police that Christie was the one who hid the body and arranged for his daughter to be looked after. In response to this new account, police searched the building where both Evans and Christie lived and discovered in the wash house in the back garden the bodies of not just Beryl Evans, but also her daughter with Timothy Evans. Both had been strangled to death. When he was informed that his wife and daughter had been strangled, Timothy Evans confessed to the crime. Or did he? His questioning by the police produced a confession, though he later stated in court that this confession was made because he feared being subjected to violence by the police. So, from the perspective of the police here, a man came in and said his wife was dead, and then he told them multiple contradictory accounts of how it happened. Most of the time, he is going to be the killer. However, Timothy Evans was not the killer. His wife and daughter were killed by John Christie. There was no botched abortion or arranging for the daughter to be sent elsewhere to be looked after. John Christie murdered them both because he was a serial killer. The things he told Timothy Evans about what had happened were lies. However, John Christie was also a former War Reserve police officer. This, coupled with the police clearly believing that Timothy Evans was obviously the killer, led them to carry out an incredibly lazy investigation. They know it's Timothy Evans, so there's no need to investigate the crime scene all that well, and we can take John Christie at his word since he used to be a copper just like us. And if Timothy Evans won't confess to the crime, we can just persuade him to confess to the crime, if you know what I mean. Wink. This led the police to missing that John Christie had bodies of his prior victims buried in shallow graves in his back garden, so shallow that a dog was able to dig up one of the skulls, and a thigh bone was later apparently found propping up his fence. He also had multiple criminal convictions for theft and assault, including attacking a woman with a cricket bat, which was seemingly overlooked by the police. Because of the police's rubbish investigation and Timothy Evans' temporary confession to the crime, however that came about, Evans was put on trial for murder on the 11th of January 1950 and was found guilty. He was executed on the 9th of March, less than three months later. So the state executed an innocent man. And this sounds like a ridiculous million-to-one shot, right? What if it wasn't the husband, and the downstairs neighbour is actually a scheming serial killer? It sounds like paranoid fiction, and it is incredibly unlikely. But things like this do happen. And there are multiple things we should take into account regarding this case. 
Firstly, it is a very good example of why it is an incredibly bad idea to execute people quickly. All those slow reviews and appeals exist to catch exactly these sorts of mistakes. Christie was caught three years later in 1953, for instance, at which point if Timothy Evans had not already been executed, he could have been let out of prison. So yes, the justice system could kill people faster, but if you do that, you're going to make more mistakes. So you have to be okay with killing more innocent people in order to make the process cheaper. I guess. So you're basically killing innocent people for money at that point, which sounds like the opposite of something the justice system should be doing. Next up, killing an innocent person is only half the crime here. Because the justice system got the wrong guy, the actual killer was still out there, and John Christie killed four more people before he was caught. Timothy Evans could have been a witness that helped to bring Christie to justice years earlier than he was. Instead, he was wrongfully executed, and Christie went on to kill again. So this is my answer to the cost of the death penalty. You can do it quick, cheap, and bad, or you can do it slow and expensive. The question is how many innocent people you're willing to risk accidentally killing. According to the Death Penalty Information Center, in the United States, for instance, more than 160 people on death row were later found to be wrongfully convicted and were exonerated. And they're just the ones who have been found, remember. The actual number of wrongfully convicted people is likely much higher than that. And let's look at some of the reasons for those exonerations. False or misleading forensic evidence, official misconduct, perjury or false accusation, inadequate legal defense, mistaken witness identification. These supposedly very unlikely scenarios happen much more often than we might like to admit. Anyway, the next pro-death penalty argument I want to take a look at is deterrence. The death penalty is worth its various downsides, it's argued, because it deters crime. Now, the big problem with this argument is that there isn't any evidence for it. For instance, comparing between states within the US that have the death penalty and those that don't, there is no positive correlation between having the death penalty and a lowered rate of crime. And for countries that have abolished the death penalty, there is no evidence that doing so caused the crime rate to rise. So that's it for this argument, right? There's no evidence. However, leaving things there would be a bit of a mistake. There is a relatively good death penalty argument to be made here with regards to deterrence. And I compiled this from various sources, but primarily from the pro-death penalty arguments contained within the book Debating the Death Penalty. So let's do the relatively good death penalty argument. And if I appeared on camera during these videos, this is the point where I'd burst through the door wearing a hat and a fake mustache and proceed to argue with myself in character. But since I'm not much of an actor, we'll all just have to use our imaginations. So the argument goes like this. The death penalty deters crime, to which the response is, no, it doesn't. There's no evidence for that. But we respond, the death penalty would deter crime. It would had it not been so weakened. There's no evidence of deterrence under our current system, sure, but under our current system, only very small amounts of crimes are eligible for the death penalty. Only a very small number of those cases actually result in a death penalty sentence. Many of those are later overturned, and the legal process between arrest and execution takes years. Of course, that system isn't deterring anyone, because the odds of getting executed are too low. It happens too slowly. It's too abstract to be a good deterrent. If we want the death penalty to discourage anyone, it needs to be used more often, faster, and for a wider variety of crimes. For instance, we'll execute someone for killing one other person in a robbery, but not a banker who defrauds thousands of people, or a politician who starts a war that kills hundreds of thousands. Now, the obvious response to increased use of the death penalty, as we talked about just previously, is that you're going to execute more innocent people. And to that, we say, the state accidentally kills innocent people all the time. If we build a new fire station, then on a long enough time scale, someone is eventually going to be hit by one of its fire trucks and killed. If we build a new motorway between two cities, there will inevitably be a fatal traffic accident on it. The innocent people killed by the death penalty are no different. 
to which the response is that those things provide useful societal benefits. We accept the downsides because they're outweighed by the positives, to which we say, so will the death penalty. With all the crime, it will definitely deter if only you loosen up a little and start using it appropriately, by which we mean a lot. I like this argument because it's at least honest about the fact that the death penalty will kill innocent people, and I find the bit about the bankers particularly persuasive. Unfortunately, it falls apart upon examination, so here's why I don't agree with it. The more substantial response to the accidental societal deaths argument is that, with regards to the potential benefits of the death penalty, the burden of proof is on the people arguing for it. It's easy to prove that having a fire department, for instance, is a good idea with obvious societal benefits. If we want the death penalty to be seen in the same way, it's on us to prove it. With something so final as the state killing a person, you can't just say it might have benefits without the evidence to back that up, and faced with a lack of evidence, we may as well take the course of action that is later reversible, rather than the one that is permanent. We can let innocent people out of prison, but we can't raise the dead. Additionally, another big problem with the deterrence argument is that it assumes a lucid murderer the sort of calculating criminals you see killing for personal profit in shows like Columbo and so on. In reality, though, not many would-be killers are sitting in front of a spreadsheet working out the odds of getting caught and the punishment they're likely to face versus the benefits of doing a murder. Hitmen, maybe, but they're not actually all that common. Most murders are unplanned and carried out impulsively without thought for the future. And for many of the worst criminals, say mass killers, serial killers and the likes, they either fully expect to be killed by the police or themselves, or they think they'll never be caught, or they don't care about being caught. No legal punishment is going to deter those people. If we do assume a lucid, calculating criminal though, the sort of criminal who would think, well, I don't mind doing life in prison, but I really don't want the death penalty, then we run into a contradiction when we propose expanding the death penalty to crimes other than murder, and it's a rather dangerous contradiction. You see, the problem is, if we make the penalty for robbery, say, the same as for murder, then our calculating criminal who just robbed someone will think, well, since the punishment is the same either way, I may as well just murder them now, because I have less chance of getting caught if the witness can't identify me on account of being dead. Expanding the death penalty to other crimes will turn a lot of those crimes into murders, assuming our calculating criminals exist anyway. Hardly anyone thinks like this, of course, but the fact that hardly anyone thinks like this is why the deterrence argument doesn't really work. Most murderers aren't thinking logically about the future, because most murderers aren't thinking logically. If they were, they probably wouldn't be murdering someone. There is also a problem with the idea of expanding the death penalty to financial and corporate crimes, as nice as that might sound. And the problem is wealth inequality. Money can buy better legal representation. You can say this or that crime should have the death penalty, but it's still the poor who are going to be the ones receiving the majority of the death penalties. Remedying that problem would take doing away with economic inequality, which funnily enough would definitely do a lot more to lower the crime rate than any possible punishment would do. More equal societies have a lower crime rate after all. Anyway, to loop back to Dennis Prager here, he doesn't make the cost argument in his video, nor does he make the deterrence argument, and that is a smart decision on his part. Both of those arguments are easily countered with evidence, after all. The death penalty is very expensive, and there is no evidence of it deterring crime. These are things that you can show with, like, statistics. So Dennis Prager wisely pins his whole case for the death penalty on the one argument which is difficult to disprove with statistics, which is, how do you feel about it? When someone does something terrible, don't you feel like they should face some equally terrible consequence? And what about the pain inflicted on the loved ones of those murdered? For most people, their suffering is immeasurably increased knowing that the person who murdered their family member or friend, and who in many cases inflicted unimaginable terror, is alive and being cared for.
Of course, putting the murderer to death doesn't bring back their loved one, but it sure does provide some sense of justice. So, this is the other argument for the death penalty, the closure argument. The death penalty provides the victim's loved ones with a sense of justice or closure or healing or so on. But is this actually true? Now, you can't speak for every victim's family and friends, of course. Different people are going to react differently. Dennis Prager uses the example of one man who wants the death penalty for the men who killed his family members, for instance. On the other hand, it is trivial to find examples of murder victims' families who oppose the death penalty. For instance, the organization Murder Victims' Families for Human Rights, who... Well, you know, you get it from the title, I imagine. They're family members of murder victims who oppose the death penalty. And that organization's website says, having all suffered a tragic loss, murder victims' families for human rights members have come in different ways and times to the understanding that the death penalty does not help us heal and is not the way to pursue justice for victims. The death penalty, as a sentence, does not provide closure. It's not carried out for a very long time, for a start. Someone sentenced today might not be killed until 2040. That's decades of them being alive and cared for, as Dennis Prager put it. And rather than providing a sense of finality, it is easier to imagine a death penalty sentence giving a sense of uncertainty, because it isn't a certain thing that the murderer will be executed. Many sentences are later changed to life imprisonment, after all. And remember that lengthy review and appeal process where the case is re-examined and often retried? How would you imagine loved ones of murder victims are going to feel about that? Particularly if they were witnesses to the crime, which means they're going to have to be directly involved in that whole process, having all the details brought up over and over again and so on. With a sentence of life in prison, the families of victims know where they're at immediately, but with the death penalty, they really don't. They're in for years of wondering what's actually going to happen. Rather than providing a sense of closure, the death penalty actually delays that closure. And I'd like to briefly mention a study just to back this up somewhat. Uh, assessing the impact of the ultimate penal sanction on homicide survivors, a two-state comparison. And let's briefly read the summary of that study. Numerous studies have examined the psychological... ramifications that result from the murder of a loved one. Except for the death penalty, however, sparse attention has been paid to the impact of the murderous sentence on homicide survivors' well-being. Given the steadfastness of the public's opinion that the death penalty brings satisfaction and closure to survivors, it is surprising that there has been no systematic inquiry directly with survivors about whether obtaining the ultimate punishment affects their healing. This study used in-person interviews with a randomly selected sample of survivors from four time periods to examine the totality of the ultimate penal sanction process and its longitudinal impact on their lives. Moreover, it assessed the differential effect of two types of UPS by comparing survivors' experiences in Texas, a death penalty state, and Minnesota, a life without the possibility of parole state. Comparing states highlights differences primarily during the post-conviction stage, specifically with respect to the appeals process and in regard to survivor well-being. In Minnesota, survivors of adjudicated cases showed higher levels of physical, psychological, and behavioral health. This study's findings have implications for trial strategy and policy development. So, at least in the case of this study, it looks like the death penalty is not providing the sense of closure that people might expect it to. And I'll post a link to this below in case anyone wants to read it in more detail. Dennis Prager ends his video by saying that he does not understand the other side of the death penalty argument, which, you know, should have gone without saying, really. Uh, but I'd like to end today by saying that I do understand the pro-death penalty argument. I understand the desire for some sense of ultimate justice with regards to the sorts of awful murderers we've been talking about. I live in England, where we do not have the death penalty. But I imagine that if someone murdered my family or friends, I would, in that moment, want that person to suffer every possible punishment, up to and including the death penalty. But that's just what I would personally want in the moment. Nothing would have changed with regards to anything else we've been talking about today. Instituting the death penalty because I want it in the one case would set the precedent for the state to execute people for other reasons that I might not agree with. 
and it would reopen the door to the possibility of innocent people being wrongfully executed. And that is ultimately a worse crime than me, as an individual, not getting what I want. Thanks a lot for watching, folks. What do you think about the death penalty? Be sure to scroll down to the comment box and write all of your opinions in a YouTube comment, which I will definitely be sure to read. Thanks, as always, to my backers over on Patreon, some of whom should be scrolling by right now. Thanks to them not only for their financial support, but also for all of their very useful feedback. And if you'd like to help me out in making more videos like this, consider having a peek at the Patreon link I will leave below. Right, that's all from me today, folks. I'll see you next time.